Well, hello there, good people. Welcome to the A2 Computer Science Revision live stream on Monday, the 3rd of January, 2022. Happy New Year to all the students. Just going to wait a few more minutes just to see if there are any more people coming on. And then we will begin. If people have got any specific subjects, topics in mind that they want to go through, then feel free to use the chat function and I'll reference that and I'll jump in and out. Um, bear in mind there is a slight delay on the chat, so if I reply to you a little bit slowly, that's because I'm getting it about 30 seconds after. So Omer, in answer to your question, I am doing this uh, to give you just a little bit more time so you've got a day to ask questions basically in between now, the revision live stream and the exam. And I've also got an AS uh, revision session tomorrow, live stream as well. So that's for the AS students. This is strictly for second years only really. Hello Victoria, good to see you. Happy New Year to you too. So it'll be beneficial for you to have the topic list open. Uh, we've got lots of things on that topic list, um, but obviously the exam won't cover it in lots of detail. It'll only cover one or two questions from each section. It's an hour and a half, and your mock exam is on Wednesday the 5th, and that's from quarter past two to quarter to four. Okay, so it's a one and a half hour um, exam. And the majority of people are in the sports hall, um, 10 people are in room 30, so please do check your timetable to work out where you are. That is all on Cedar, and you can check that out. Looks like we've got a few people now. So I'll just shout out there. Does anybody have any specific requests for anything from the topic list? Um, I'm, I'm aware students are comfortable in certain areas, and they might be slightly less comfortable in others. So Victoria, for you, if you think remember back to the big O notation that we did in class, and we did those example questions in class, they're the kind of question sets that you'll get for the mock exam. Okay, Baxter's algorithm. No problem. So as people firing, uh, yeah, as people firing questions into there, I'll just skip on. Um, I'll make all this stuff available to you after the uh, live stream as well, so you've got this revision presentation, so to speak, which covers a lot of things. I've highlighted the things on your topic list on there, so it's easier for you to find out. Now, Dijkstra's algorithm is a shortest path algorithm, which means we're in searching down here. So we go past our searches, and we look at Dijkstra's algorithm. Now, the key Dijkstra's algorithm is he's remembering the, the algorithm itself. So you might be asked to describe it, and you might also be asked to demonstrate it. So demonstrate the shortest path of a graph. So remember the algorithm. We take our graph, which is nodes, and it has edges connected to each node. And the first thing we do is we assign initial costs to each of the nodes. So we assign the infinity symbol to all the other nodes, and then we set the starting node to zero. We add all the vertices to a set of unvisited nodes because we've not been to those nodes yet. And we set the start node to be the current node. This will all make sense when I show you the image in a second. For all unvisited neighbors, we put them on one side of the current node. We then visit each unvisited neighbor of the node. And then we just simply add the costs up as we go through. And if we come across a node that has a new cost that's less than the current cost there, then we replace it because we found a faster route. And then we remove the current node from the set of unvisited nodes because we've been there. Remember, once we've been to a node, we can never go back again. So we then put that in the, in the visited um, list. And then we repeat steps three to five until we've visited every node. Okay, so let's, let me show you this algorithm then on an example. So in the exam, you could be confronted with a graph. I'll just get my pen. So here's a graph from A 
B, C, D, E, F, and Z. So the root will be A to Z in this. And please look at the exam question to see the actual number of marks you're going to get for this. Okay? Because remember, if it's worth maybe two marks to find the, the, the fastest route, then you don't have to go through the whole table, although I would recommend it because it's, it's foolproof. If you get it spot on and you take your time with it, the number one mistake I see people make is they rush this because they think they're confident with it and they rush it and they make silly mistakes and they lose marks for no reason. So A to Z, hello Lewis, um, A to Z there, we need to get to. So think about this now, here's my graph, it has three columns. I have the nodes in here, I have the costs, of those nodes and I have the via. So which which node did I come from? That's what that means. Now if we start in at A, then the cost would be set to zero and we're not going via anything because we're already at A. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, if I'm here now currently, what connects to A? There's only two nodes that A can see. Okay, so if, I, if I'm sat at a, the A node, the A has no idea about F, it has no idea about E, no idea about D and no idea about Z. It cannot see them. It can only see the B node and the C node because those are the only nodes that are connected to A in the first place. So A to B. So if, I, if A looks at B, it does that for a cost of four. So it says I can get to B. It's going to cost me four though. So in here, I'll put, it's going to cost me four and I'm going via the A node. If my pen works, come on, there we go via the A node. Do the same for C as well. So A can get to C for a cost of three. So I'll put three in there and we go via A. And now we've done that, A has been ticked off. I've visited it. I'm not gonna, I can't go back to A ever again once I've interrogated all the nodes connected to it. So now what we do in the algorithm is we look at the, the table and we say, which has the lowest cost? I've got four and three. So three is the lowest cost, which means I move now to the C node. So I'm just gonna draw my little circle around it. I'm now sat at the C node and I can't see B because I'm not connected to it. I can't go back to A anymore. So the only nodes that I can have a look at is the E node and the D node. So E will cost me 10. Now it will cost me 10, but how many, how much did it cost for me to get to C in the first place? It cost me three. So in total, it'll cost me 13 to get to E in the first place, okay? And that goes via the C node this time. Then to D, it's gonna cost seven. So D is a cost of seven plus the current cost of that node, which is three. And that's gonna cost me a total of 10 to get to D from the A node, okay? And I went via the C node. So now I've done those two. I've visited all the nodes at C. I tick that off, I can never go back there again. We look in the table and we go, which is the lowest cost? Is it four, is it 10, is it 13? The lowest cost is four. So then I go, right, I'm gonna to jump to B and I'm now sat at B. Tick that off. Now B can see F, it can see E, but it can't see anything else past that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say B has a current cost of four in the table and it's gonna cost me five more to get to F. And that's for a total of nine. So nine in there and I went via the B node. And then I go, okay, I can get to E for a cost of 12. So 12 plus the cost of getting to B in the first place of four, that's 16 in total. So E has a cost of 16, but in my table, I already have a lower cost than 16. So I'm not gonna change it because I've already got a faster route. So I'll leave it alone. And that means B now has been visited. I'm done at B. Then I look at my table and say, I've got 10, 13, and nine. The next node I'm going to is F because it was a cost of nine and that's the lowest cost in my table. So now I'm at F. F can see Z only for a cost of 16 plus the cost of nine. So we add those up and we say that's 25. So 25 to get to Z and we went via F. That's it, done for F. Can't see anything else. And then what we do is we look at the next lowest cost which is 10. So we jump all the way back to D over here and we can't go back to C. D can only see the E node. So D's current cost is 10 plus the two it's gonna take me to get to E. So that's 12 in total. So I can get to E this time for a cost of 12. I've got 13 in there so I can 
scribble this out and I can put 12 in there because that's a faster route and I'll get rid of this C and I'll put, I can get there quicker going via D instead. No more nodes can be seen, so I tick that off. Look in my list, I've got 25 and 12. So the next node I'm gonna go to now is E. And E can only see Z, I can't go to B anymore because it's already been visited. I can't go to C or D because they've already been visited. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look and say, well, E has a current cost of 12 plus the five. It's gonna take me to get to Z. So that in total, all in all is 17, which is faster than that. So I'll get rid of this and I'll go via E this time. And now what we do is once we've visited that, we tick that off. We're now at the destination node. We're at the end node. So Dijkstra's algorithm flood fills the network, checks every single node and works out the lowest cost. So the final mark that you're gonna get for the question is something like, tell me the fastest cost and tell me the route. So the fastest cost is 17. That's the fastest cost to get to, from A to Z. And what route did we take? Well, we went, destination was Z. So you look in your table and go, well, this was my destination node and I went via the E node. So I'll put E next to Z there. And looking at E in the table, E went via the D node. So I'll put D there. And I look at D in the table and that went via C. So I'll put C there. And then I went C, and that went via A. So I'll put A there. So this was the fastest route, A to C, to D, to E, and then to Z for a cost of 17. That was the fastest route around. Okay, and that's what you're gonna get asked, those kind of questions. Can you show me the table? Can you populate the table? Can you show me the fastest cost proven? And can you show me the fastest route as well? And that's Dijkstra's algorithm. So what should we look at next? People do have questions about that, by the way. Feel free to fire away. So on our topic list, we've got program paradigms, We've got logical operators, sorting and searching, big O notation, compression, algorithms, looking at pseudocode and building pseudocode, data structures, dry running algorithms, data representation, the software development lifecycle with maintenance and testing, and then we've got Boolean algebra as well. So as people are putting some uh, thoughts in the chat, what I'll do is I'll carry on. I'll just fire through these. Okay, just seen that from uh, Victoria. So let's have a look at some dry running algorithms. So what I'll do is I'll just, um, I'll come out of here, just go to this other program. Let's take a look at a dry running algorithm. Okay. So, Dry running is quite a difficult skill. It requires you to look at an algorithm, interpret the algorithm, and list all the event, all the different possibilities. No, Abigail, it's an AS, it's an AS topic. Hello there, big supporter, Balamaku222. Thank you very much for joining us today. So Abigail, we did uh, compression last year, we did data representation last year uh, as well, so you'll be covering those. But if people want any information, if you wanna look at a detailed compression, I made a video on it just at the start of Christmas. So you can have a look on the YouTube channel. So if here, you'll get a question like this for dry running, you'll get an algorithm and it'll say, it says something like, below is a segment of an algorithm that determines if an item is present in an array and if it is present, uh, at what position the item is located in the array. It says input search value. It has a couple of different um, variables. So what I do, my number one recommendation to you is you write down your variables. We've got an I variable, we've got a position variable, 
we've got, um, so that position variable is currently zero because that's been initialized. I is set to one and found equals false. All right, so first thing I would recommend you to do is get a scrap piece of paper or go to the back of your exam booklet or whatever and write down the variables, okay? Now, we've got a repeat condition. So this is gonna continue. This is called a post condition loop because the post part, post means at the end. It's not a precondition loop because it's not at the start. It just says repeat until. So that means you run this first and then you run this after, okay? So you run the code once at least and then you interrogate the condition, all right? Now, it says found, it says repeat until found equals true or i is greater than seven. So the or condition, we know that one of these conditions has to be true, whether that's the found or the i, one of them has to be true, okay? So the first thing you're gonna do is found is false currently, as you can see, and i is currently less than seven. So both of those conditions are gonna fail, but we have to run it once because it's a post condition loop. If people do have questions as I'm going through here, please ask away. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go from the start but if you have two, two conditions like and, and with that, an and. Okay, so if you have an and, it means that both conditions have to be true in order for you to keep looping. As long as one of these is true, this will keep going round in a circle. So here it says, if the search value, the thing that's been inputted by the person, so what I'll do up here is I'll just put search value, okay? search value, because that's what's gonna be inputted by the user up here. So if the search value is equal to search array at the position of i. So somewhere, somewhere we've got this thing called search array. And we all know how arrays work. We have different elements in there. Zero, one, two, three, etc. Then it says, found equals true, position equals i, else set i to equal i plus one, end if. Okay? Now down here at the bottom, once you've been through this code and you've said, you've read this and you've looked at this loop and you've said, if found equals true, then output items found at position, else item uh, not found in the array, end if. So it looks like a simple search this. Looking at this, I think this is something like it's, well, it's a linear search. That's what it is, really. So it says, complete the table below and show how each variable changes when the algorithm is performed on the test data given. So you have to show in this table, when anything changes, you have to list it. So my search array, the data has been provided here. All right, so in position one, it's not, not starting at position zero, so I can scribble that out. So position one is gonna be 23. Position two is gonna be 45. And position three is gonna be 12, etc., etc. They're all in here. So hopefully you can make that connection. All right. So I could, realistically, I could fill this out and go, well, that's position three, that's position four, etc., etc. But the algorithm's gonna do that for me anyway. So let's have a look then. Let's have a look. It's already ran this twice and outputted the result of this. So if I just took this data that they've given us here and I said, well, all right, I is one and then our position zero and found is false. So the user has entered the search value for the first one, which is 23. Okay, we don't have to do this, but I'm just gonna prove to you that these things that they've put there are correct through the algorithm. So if I enter the search value of 23, it says if the search value, which is 20, oh, come on, 23, is equal to, oh, my bad, get rid of that. Okay, we don't know what they've entered. We don't know what they've entered yet. So if we go through, have a look at this, search value is 98, oh, there you go, so it's not 23. Come on, John, 98.
So I've got 98 in there. And the search term, what is at position I currently? Well, if I is set to 1, then that is going to be 23. So is 98 the same as 23? No, it's not. So it's going to fail that condition. It's going to go to the else part, and it's going to increment I. So that's going to change to 2. Okay, I'll just pause for a second, just for you to see that, what I did there. So the search value has been provided here. I'm checking if what's in the search array, so the array here, at the position of 1, because I is 1 currently. What's been provided? And that's 23. Okay, and 98 is not the same as 23, so it fails the if statement. It jumps down and increments I. Set I to equal whatever I is currently, which is 1, plus 1, which then changes it to 2. So it increments I. Okay. And then we go until found equals true. So found is false. Or I is greater than 7. So we keep in here. So it's going to end if these conditions are true. So currently found is not false. So we're going to continue going. Okay, I'll say that again. So we continue until found is true. So currently it's false, so we're going to keep going. So what we do now is we say, right, we've incremented i, so we come along, the search value is still the same, equals search value my array. Now i is changed to 2. So what is in search array at position 2? It's now 45. So if I change this to 45... Is 98 the same as 45? The answer is no. So again, we increment i to 3. And that is currently what is in there so far. Now I'm here. I'm at, I'm at this bit here where we're going to start getting some marks. So i is now 3. So we come along again and we say, right, what's at position 3 now? Position 3 is 12. Is 98 the same as 12? No, it's not. So again, found is false. And position is still zero. Yeah, look at position. It's still zero. Then we increment i because it's failed the if statement here. We increment i again. And now we say, well, what's at position four? Position four is 67. So I'll get rid of this. 67. Is 98 the same as 67? No, it's not. So again, this is false. And that is zero. Okay. I gets incremented again. So I is changed to five now. Wish it would stop doing that. There we go. And then we say, right, what's in there at position five? It's now 98. Is 98 the same as 98? Yes, it is. So because it is found, now gets set to true. Because we've passed this condition, we go into here. So we're looking at this line now. Found equals true. So we get rid of that. Found is now true. We put true in there. And position gets set to i. So position becomes whatever i is i is currently 5. So position changes to 5. And 5 goes in there. Okay. And then what we do is we finish that. We go down to the end loop. And because we've changed this now, found is equal to true. So found is equal to true, which is true. Or i is greater than 7. Well, i is not greater than 7. So it's false. But we've got a true statement. So we pass the condition and we finish the loop. Then it goes down here and says if found equals true, then output item found in the array at position. Position is currently 5. So it outputs that. And that's it. Three marks for those three boxes. Dry running is you taking data and running it through the algorithm. 
Now in this presentation, there's a few more that you can run yourself and you can try it. And I've put the mark scheme in there for you as well. So you can have a go at that yourself. There's also some driver and algorithms on my YouTube channel. You can have a look at those and go through them at your own speed. Okay, all the examiner is looking for is can you understand things like initialization of variables? Can you take data and loop it? Can you take selection statements and run data through those to see if something's true or false? And can you abide by conditions? That's all they're checking. So if you're a good, if you practice your programming skills, you practice your pseudocode skills, you'll be able to dry run no problem. And if we check the mark scheme, that's exactly what we got. Okay, the marks were only awarded for the bits where we needed to enter the I variables, enter the found variables, and enter the positions, and that gives you three marks. Seems like a lot of work for three marks, but it's always dry run and algorithm questions in exams. Okay, next topics, where are we going next? So a couple of things that we might not have covered yet, binary, so you, I wonder if you can remember what binary is from your first year. Do we need to go over that? Testing and maintenance is fairly straightforward. That might be quite quick. So if I just head over to testing. Now testing is Fairly straightforward, it comes just after halfway through the software development life cycle. We're not gonna go through the, the development life cycle because you don't need it all. Um, however, testing and maintenance are the two most important things. What can they actually test you on? Well, they can give you, you can give you an algorithm like a dry run, test data, and do that, or they can quiz you about these things on here. So testing, we've got white box and unit testing. We've got black box testing. We've got alpha, beta testing, and end user testing. And with these, you can test using something called logical pathways, which is looking at all the different pathways that the data could go through. Like an if statement has two uh, pathways, true or false. Nested ones go further than that. We have normal data, which is valid. Uh, we can get valid normal data, which is just put data in and it just works, uh, or it should work. Extreme data means it can, you can have extreme um, valid data, which means it works within the extremes of the, the boundaries of the data type. And we've got invalid extreme as well. Then we've got something called erroneous data, which is data of a different data type. So they're the, they're the types of data that we can use by doing all these different types of testing, like white box and unit testing and black box and alpha beta end user testing as well. Okay, so let's have a quick skim through these then. So white box testing, the structure of the code is being tested. And this is very, very, very early on. And it requires knowledge of how the code was developed. So it's done by the developers themselves. And each path must be tested in order for, in order to be sure that the code will run as expected. So it's detailed. It's done by the developers who made the, or who wrote the code in the first place. All right, black box testing. This is where we hand over to somebody else, okay? If you've got an in-house testing team, you hand your code over to them, or you can basically hire in uh, third parties to do this. So we don't have knowledge of the code, we're testing. Um, you get a test script and you just run the test script. So think about like a simple addition program. You have, um, if I put a two in there and I put a three in there, it should output five. If it doesn't, it's an invalid test, something's wrong. We don't care about what is actually wrong. We just say, I put that data in and it didn't work. 
And that's a black box test, okay? So it's done by people not involved in development and it's done systematically using a test script. Okay, um, and there we go. There's our uh, different data types again or our different types of valid, invalid, and extreme data because we test lots of different things. So the test script is actually quite long when using these, okay? And if, we, if the output on our sheet matches what's actually output from the system, then we pass the test, okay? So again, fairly basic. White box is early on by the developer. Black box is still early on, but it's done by other people separate to the program. That, that means we don't have any bias anymore. Okay, unit tests are fantastic. We set them up normally before we even actually create the code itself because they're, they're little scripts that just run the code. Um, and we can once we've built the unit test, we can run them as many times as we want just with different sets of inputs. So a lot of um, developers spend a lot of time developing unit tests because it's all automated and that's what the scripts are for okay um, and it allows us to do fast testing at different stages of the project so if we need to go back or we make changes if we're doing an agile methodology if we want to make changes it's easy for us to do and we can test it quickly again using the same unit test that we built before okay changes later on in the project will be picked up by the unit tests which limits the potential bugs in the system. And that's all testing is. It's just trying to remove as many bugs as possible. And for our, parad for our paradigms and people that have studied the paradigms, normally makes use of object-oriented programming. So there we go, logical pathways. We talked about it before with uh, true if statements, true or false, normal data, data that works, extreme and invalid data. So there's a few definitions for you. If you haven't got those on a flashcard, I recommend you do put them on. Okay, these are the ones that students tend to remember quite well because the games that you people play nowadays, you normally you get a beta or an alpha. Uh, you don't normally see alpha test alpha games, but you normally get beta tests. Um, and the classic example is Microsoft. They'll send out their beta version of their operating system. You download it. It's very buggy. It automatically sends analytics back to the tech development team and they've got free testing. They've got millions of users and lots of free testing. If they paid people to do that level of testing, it would cost them an absolute fortune. So alpha testing is covered by the developers, conducted by them, or testers that are working alongside them. Again, in-house testers. That's what lots of larger companies have. And it's typically module by module or subroutine by subroutine because remember, you break the, pro the program down into smaller parts and you test modules rather than testing the whole system by itself. And that just allows us to be a bit more neater with what we're doing. We would never, ever give the user an alpha program, really, because it contain contains lots of bugs. It's, very, it's a raw program. But beta testing, so conducted by prospective end users who use the system as they would use the end product. So notify the developers of any bugs that they identify and that can be done automatically nowadays we used to have to send test reports back but now the world's moved on things are a lot more efficient and then we've got acceptance testing so acceptance testing is usually when you get the end user in the stakeholder the person paying for it and you let them use it against their requirements and it either works or it doesn't and then they'll accept the program or not. Um, I've seen a few heated debates when acceptance has not worked and they've said, no, I'm not accepting this. It's not what I asked for. Um, and you've got oh, three years in development. It's, uh, it can get pretty heated. We've got end user testing as well. So end user testing is tested by people um, who are actually the intended user of the program. So if you've got a game, you would get a select sample of game um, customers in and get them to try it. That's end user testing. All right. So that's testing for you. Maintenance, there's only three types of maintenance. You've got perfective, adaptive, and corrective. Okay, they're the three types. So perfective aims to make a functioning system even better if there are any bugs, which there really shouldn't be with perfective maintenance. Um, and that might be um, adding things like multiple input methods, speeding up the network connection, tweaking the interface, um, improving system login times, that kind of thing. And the system must match the specification perfectly. And it's very, very expensive because it takes a lot of detailed work and a lot of intricate knowledge of the system 
that's been made. So adaptive maintenance, this is where the system, you change the system to match changing requirements. So we got a new GDPR law where we had to change all the uh, pop-ups for cookies on websites. A lot of adaptive maintenance went on with websites there. Um, and it might require things like storage of additional data or let's say we the, the VAT, the value added tax rate changed in the UK, then we would make that change to our systems. And it can be done remotely. Um, we don't have to get people in to actually do it. We can deploy remotely. Um, and then the third one, corrective maintenance um, exists to remo remove bugs that were not addressed during testing. And it might not even be your system, so you might get hired um, you might get hired to basically come in and do corrective maintenance on a faulty system. And it's very, very difficult if it's not your system. But you, there's companies that exist out there to do this kind of thing. Come in and rectify bad programs or bad systems. That's it for maintenance. So I'm just going to tick these off as we go to make sure we've covered these kind of things. Again, if you do have requests, do fire away. So we've done Dijkstra, done testing, maintenance. We've had a look at driver algorithms now. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly show people this question. Okay, you're going to need to be able to do all of these things, so... Have a look and think. I want you to quickly scan that and think, can I answer all those questions? Look at the amount of marks that are on offer for this question. This question is set. It's incredible. So let's start with the first question then, okay? Please listen to what I'm about to say. If you're attempting these questions, take your time, okay? You, it's very easy to get marks on, but a lot of people lose marks because they just, again, they just rush it for no reason. So the first question, convert the hexadecimal numbers. Now, hexadecimal numbers are in base 16, which is what this small subscript number is. So we've got nine, in base 16 okay so if i just put here nine and that's going to consist of let me just put these little numbers so hexadecimal for me consists of two nibbles so how do i represent nine well nine is just nine on its own so i'll just put that there like that so what i've done there is i've just converted a base 16 number into a base two number okay now that's that's fairly easy um, for people to do if you remember hexadecimal hexadecimal goes one to nine. Oh, yep one to nine and then um, it goes from a to f okay up to 15 okay so a is going to be 10 b is going to be 11 etc etc all right so let's show, let me show you C then, Should prove that, 16, so 1, 2, 4, 8, that's an 8 by the way, it's very difficult to write on this tablet, 4 and 8, so there you go, so that's two nibbles, it's two 4 bits on its own, and C, uh, if A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, okay, so C being 12 is going to be uh, an 8 and a 4. There we go. They're all zeros. All right. So what I've done there is I've got myself a mark because I've converted those two into eight-bit binary numbers. Then it says using binary addition. So I've got to add these two numbers together, and it says calculate the binary number. Notice it doesn't say calculate the deanery number. If it says calculate the binary number, you can leave it in its eight-bit binary form. Okay. You must show all of your working. So what I'm going to do now is this is where students make mistakes. 
okay? If I'm going to put 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Now, students make mistakes here because they accidentally move 1s and zeros in the wrong columns. So when they're trying to add it up, it becomes a lot more difficult. So if I draw a line under here, and then I use binary addition. So if I take a 1 and add it to a 0, that gives me 1. Then I take a 0 and a 0. 0 added to 0 is 0 in binary. 0 and a 1 is going to give you 1. And then we've got a 1 and a 1. A 1 and a 1 in binary is 0, and you carry the 1 over. Then you take 0, 0, and add a 1 to it. 0, 0, and 1 is just 1. 0, and 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, and 0 is 0. Okay, just check. I've got 8 bits there. Yes, I have. And then, if I was to look at this as a number, I can quickly check that my answer is correct, because that's going to be a 1. That's going to be a 2, 4 bit there. Uh, 8 and 16. So I've got 16 plus I've got a 4 and I've got a 1. Okay, so that should be 20. Why did I put a 2 there? So that should be 21. Okay, and if you look at it, 9 plus the 12, 21. There you go. So I know that's right check my answer um that looks right to me and i can leave it like that because it wants it left in a binary number it didn't ask me to do this so you didn't have to do this if it didn't say convert it to a deanery number okay so it's that question now this one hopefully you found that quite straightforward again if you've got questions do fire away convert the hexadecimal numbers oh oh what's this here negative seven in base 16 and b in base 16 into two 8-bit binary numbers using two's complementation. Two's complementation. Then using binary addition, calculate the binary number that would result from adding them. Very similar to the top question, but this two's complementation, that's the only difference between these two questions. So how do we do this? The first step I would take is I would say, well, what is B? B in base 16, if A is 10, B is going to be 11. So how do I represent 11 using nibbles or four bits? Here we go. Uh, 11 is going to be one of those, one of those, and one of those, none of those, and none of those. Okay, 11, done. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do seven, right? I'm not going to do negative seven i'm gonna i'm gonna represent seven using eight bits and then i'm gonna use two's complement to convert it into a negative number so seven in nibbles one two four eight is zero one 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 they're ones by the way oh, weird and that's four that's eight that's zero 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 right so that's seven okay i've got a one there and i've got a one there so three ones so now, to flip this to be negative 7, what we do, and listen to this, because you might be asked to do this in an exam, you might be asked to describe how you do two's complementation. So I'll explain it. We go up to and including the first one. So I come along, I start at the least significant bit, which is down here, and we go up to and including the first one. Well, the first number I've looked at is the one, so I write one. And then you invert the rest. So that one becomes a zero. That one becomes a zero. That zero becomes a one. And those four zeros all become ones. Okay? So I've, I've used two's complementation. I'm about halfway through my marks. Binary addition, calculate the binary number. So you get one mark if the binary number is correct at the end. And you get one mark for the correct addition. So now I'll take this 8-bit number... 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 1, and 1. Binary addition, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. If you don't put your carry bits, you're going to lose a mark. So please do not be silly. 
put your carry bits. Zero, one, and one is zero. Zero, carry the one. Zero, zero, and one is just one. One and one is zero, carry the one. And this is gonna be one and one and zero is zero, carry the one. Zero, carry the one. Zero, carry the one. And zero, carry the one. Got one here. And that is overflowed, okay? Because we're only using eight bits. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That overflowed bit there gets ignored. Okay? That is the number that results from the binary addition of those two base 16 numbers, okay? So you'll be expected to convert base 16 into base 2. You'll be expected to convert it, and you might be expected also to convert that into base 10, which is normal numbers that we use every day, okay? These are more the A-level questions. They're very AS questions, those. These are the more... Um, a level questions. So in a certain computer system, real numbers, real numbers are stored in floating point form using 16 bits as shown below. The mantissa, the mantissa is used to show the value of the number and the exponent is to show you how many places the decimal point is going to move. So 12 bits into its complement form the binary point in the mantissa is immediately after the left bit. Four bits in two's complement form. That is a lot of talk, a lot of confusing stuff, but it's actually really simple if you follow my four steps. And I'll show you what those are in a minute if you don't know what they are. 45.75 in base 10, convert it into this format. So we're expected to turn it into a 16-bit number from deanery. So... Let me show you then. So step one, I'll put smallest bits here. Okay, what I mean by smallest bits is convert 45.75 using the smallest number of bits. So one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 60, right. So I'll take a 32 out of that. Okay, so all we're doing here is we're converting the number 45.75 into the smallest number of bits. So if I've got 45 and I take out 32 from there, it's going to leave me with 13. So I can't get 13 out of 16, so I get rid of that. That is really annoying. There we go. Um, I've got 13 left. I'll take 8 out of that. We'll take eight out of that, so we'll take one of those, and that leaves me with five. I'll take one of those, none of those, and one of those. Okay, so look at that number. Does that represent 45? Uh, 32 plus eight, that's 45, yeah, 45. I'm just trying to put a dot so you can actually see it. There we go. Now, everything after the point gets halved, so if we've got one there, It'll be 0 0.5 after decimal point, and it'll be 0 0.25, and I take one of those and one of those because that represents 75. So 0 0.5 plus 25 is 75. So already you're going to get a mark for doing that. Convert it into binary into base two in the smallest number of bits. The next step now: normalize the number. So to normalize the number is this bit here, this, this bit that it's talking about. The binary point in the mantissa is immediately after the left bit. So because this is a positive number, 45.75, we're literally just going to put a point, a naught point at the front. Okay, that zero tells us it's a positive number. And now it looks like I've got two decimal, decimal points in there, haven't I? Don't worry about that at all. Normalize, all you have to do is put naught point in front of the number. That's it. Now, I've never seen a negative question, so it will always be naught point. The next thing to do is now is to pad the number out to the required number of bits. 
So how many bits did it say for the Mantissa? It said 12. How many have I got so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Always pad on the right hand side. Every single year I say it, and there's always at least one person who ignores my advice and pads on the left hand side. If you put any values on the left hand side of the number, it will push the number down one or two or three or four points to the right hand side. And every time you shift this number down one to the right hand side, it halves the number every time. So any anything put at the front of the number is going to change the value of it. If you put it at the end, it has, it has no effect whatsoever, okay? It's just padding on the end. So please, pad on the right-hand side, never the left. So we've got 12 now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Notice I didn't count the points in there because they don't exist, okay? They only exist for you and me looking at it. Now then, next thing, after we've padded it, we work out the exponent okay the exponent is the difference between this decimal point and this one so it's one two three four five six it's six places that's the difference six places so the exponent is going to be six and I've got four bits to represent the number six so it's one two four and eight but that 8 is basically negative 8 because it's in 2's complement form. So can I represent 6 using this? Yes, I can. And there we go. So in total, the number that they're looking for in the end is that. That's your final number. That's this number here. And then I stick this on the end. That's my, that's my exponent. All right, and that's it for three marks. So remember the steps. Convert the number given into the smallest number of bits. Normalize by putting naught point at the front. Pad it to the required number of bits in the question. And then work out the exponent using the number of bits provided in the question as well. Okay. Now then, you're expected to do that for three marks. The flip side of that question is this part. In different computer systems, real numbers are stored using floating point form, an 8-bit signed mantissa, and a 4-bit signed exponent. Calculate your working, calculate decimal value of this here. What on earth are they asking us? Now, I'm going to have to clear my screen because I've run out of space. Okay, bosh. So what they're asking is if I just write this number out here, 0 0.1001. One zero one one zero one zero one base two three marks okay now signed exponents don't be, don't be scared of signed exponents when it's assigned it just means this is going to be a plus or a minus plus or a minus <coughs> now if it's zero it has no effect anyway so you don't even have to don't even have to consider that now. The only important bit here from the question is we've got eight bits for the mantissa and we've got four bits for the exponent. So I can come along and go, this is my exponent. I chop off the back four bits. This is my exponent. If I was to put numbers above that, one, two, four, what value is that going to be? Well, it's going to be five, John. Well done. Good work. Then, once you've worked out the exponent, come along to your normalized point, which is your decimal point here, and go... One, two, three, four, five. That is where the decimal point should go. Once you put the decimal point in the right place, from the left-hand side of the decimal point, you write one, two, four, eight, sixteen. And on the right-hand side of the decimal point, you write 0 0.5 and 0 0.25. Because we're going halves, don't we, on the right-hand side? So that is 7, 5. Add those two together. And then you've got a 2 plus a 16, which means it's 18.75. There we go. We've converted that into the decimal value. And that gets you three marks. 
How many people are asleep yet? Many, 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 many. So that's data representation. That's a little blast from the past at AS. Done that, done that. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is quickly, I'm going to fire through programming paradigms. Um, I will take a calculator with you, Victoria. You are permitted to have one in the exam. Um, you can use it if you really want to. You don't. I, I would personally say you don't necessarily need one. But if you do want one to check your answers and do like you know faster binary, then by all means, if you think your mental mass isn't strong enough. Okay. Right. Let's fire through this nice and quickly because this is the topic that we did just before Christmas, pretty much. So procedural, event-driven, visual, markup, and object-oriented, okay? You need to focus a little bit more on the object-oriented stuff. There's a tip for you, okay? So programming paradigms. Paradigm, fundamental structure and approach of a programming language. It's basically the style in which we write in. We can mix these paradigms. We can use them in conjunction with other things. So procedural paradigms. They go from top to bottom without stopping unless we encounter a control statement. Things like iteration, selection, okay? So very simple, like things like Python, scripts, procedural, okay? V good control over the underlying operation of hardware, lots of control. We have, we specify every step, every single step, all right? So all of these paradigms have very similar things. So variable assignment, you're used to that. Selection, sequence, uh, iteration, and modularity, breaking things up, adding them together. So think about it. If you think about explaining what procedural language is and you don't mention procedures, then you are a moron. You need to think about that. Procedures, procedural, okay? Um, do you have to know them by name? Uh, the paradigms? No. Because the question will usually refer to it. Okay, the question will say, using uh, explain the, the features of procedural languages, for example, or explain what classes are in object oriented programming. It'll always say in the question. Thank you, Hyper, whoever you are. So, procedural languages are also known as imperative languages. That doesn't really matter, it's not really that important. Um, imperative. I just use statements to change the state of the program. They stem from the old languages of the past. Visual programming. We looked at Scratch in lesson. You know my feelings on Scratch and how utterly garbage it is. But the focus here is on the graphics, the visual element of it, the dragging and dropping, the, the events that we can create from dragging and dropping. Um, we know that all games use make use of visual um, and all games make use of events. So I've told you in the past, the most important bit from this is it's normally used for younger people that are learning, that are starting their journey in programming. So it's all about the elimination of the need to remember syntax. More focus on logic, okay? More focus on the logic. We don't need to remember specific syntax about things, all right? Event-driven, this is probably, well, this is one of the most popular par paradigms because we always require user interaction. So it will normally be written using event-driven. Um, we mix and match everything with event-driven normally. And the point is, we have things called event listeners that action when something happens. Hopefully that makes sense. So when you click a button, action happens. Okay, and that's your event listener. Okay, keys pressed, operating system works out what you've pressed, tells the event processor, you program the event listeners, and it goes, well, what did they press? They pressed a W. Great, so move the player forward. That kind of thing. All right? That's what that diagram's all about. You've all got that in your handouts, uh, on your, oh, sorry, on your workbooks online. So you can have a look at that if needs be. Um, event processors, 
nested loop structure, yeah, well, it's going to be selection statements really because it's literally saying if they press W, what do you want to do? If they press A, what do you want to do? If they press B, what do you want to do? That kind of thing. Right? So event driven. All the event listeners that you create are all called rather than just ran one after another. We check it, don't we, through selection statements and it's massive streams of selection statements. Yeah, very common, very, very common. So markup languages, you know how to get marks when we talk about markup language. So you, the, the actual, the fact that you need to mention the name, the most common one known to man is hypertext markup languages. We use chevrons and they apply style or meaning to plain text. That's all they do. Sometimes it's not very nice. It's very basic. You've probably made websites before. You see me make websites in class, uh, a basic website in class. And we basically just take chevrons that with commands and put it around text and the browser interprets what you try to mean. Okay. So there's some HTML and to get marks, you could talk about uh, a title tag. You could talk about H1 being a heading, uh, a P being a paragraph, IMG, an image tag, etc. So that would all get you marks on a mark scheme. All right. The fact that you can say use chevrons for the tags and use a, a forward slash to uh, close a tag at the end. That is all on mark schemes, people. All of it. Um, focus on HTML, you, I would say you don't even need to think about XML, but that's just another example anyway. Okay. XML is used for storage and HTML is used for display. Okay. That's, that's the major difference. But if you focus on HTML, you will mop up all the marks that you need to on any mark scheme anyway. All right. You can mix and match. So you can bring in, um, HTML as a, we're on number five at the moment. JavaScript is number five and CSS is number three. Um, they're the versions that we're on currently. I think that's still the same. Uh, and they change. So when the versions change, you get more features and more functions and they improve it a little bit. So you can mix and match. JavaScript basically adds the programming element to HTML to basically make it um, do more things, more exciting things rather than just display. Okay, if you've not looked into Web3 yet, you really should because Web3 is coming out or it is out um, and it's going to change the internet as we know it. So look at that. And then we've got non-procedural. So this weird looking Sophia robot, non-procedural, think about it like the nemesis to procedural. Procedural is very specific, very, very specific. All done, all steps laid out by the programmer. Non-procedural, we do not care at all about the order. It's all, we just give it data and we just care about the outputs really. So they stem from databases, and we rely or we focus on rules, queries, and facts. And things like examples here are like language systems because there's lots of ambiguity, grammar, and artificial intelligence. That's what we use non-procedural for because we allow the computer to compute and make its own decisions rather than us specifying them explicitly. There's less requirement for us to do that in non-procedural languages. Now, I said there's more focus needed on this section. Um, so, objects oriented. The exam board always makes more fuss about this. So, once you understand the base of procedural, people normally move on to object oriented because it matches the real world. Okay? And you get all the same features that you get before from your procedural stuff, like your variables, your if statements, selection, that kind of thing. But you need to start thinking about what, you, what other things you get. So procedural, procedures are called, they're containers of code, okay? In object-oriented, we replace procedures with methods. They do the same thing. We call methods as we need them. Objects are created from classes. So like I said in class, you are all objects of your parents. Your parents are classes and you are the objects, okay? Now, when that happens, we get things like encapsulation, which is the method of hiding using public and private because we don't want people to access certain things in our code. 
We have something called polymorphism, which is a method of overriding or changing the behavior based on what's given. We have inheritance, which is exactly the same as genetic inheritance that we have in human beings. And we have classes and objects. So reusable code. And if you ever see or you're ever asked about a definition about classes, you need to use the word template or blueprint. Okay, They are the words that you need to access the mark scheme. We have something called abstraction as well which is the removal of complexity. And there we are. So objects, classes, and methods. So an object is a combination of data and the actions that can operate on that data. Okay? So classes have attributes and they have methods. Okay? Say that again. Classes have attributes and they have methods. Attributes are basically variables and methods are procedures okay and when you create an object from a class you inherit all the uh, attributes and all of the methods and a class is the definition of an object so it embodies all the information needed to create and manipulate objects of a particular type so in class the car is the superclass the parent class and the ford jaguar and aston martin you see on the screen there they are all subclasses. All right. So a class has two main sections, attributes and methods. And methods are fundamental. It's a piece of code that implements one behavior of a class, like turning left in a Tesla, for example. So in order to identify an individual car, it must be described and in object oriented when you create an object from a class, we have a fancy word for that and it's called instantiation. So you, little objects out there on YouTube, you have all been instantiated from your parents. There you go. Who'd have thought it? All right. So here, as we said in class, this should be all familiar to you. Here we're saying Ford objects is given the value. That is the straightest line I've ever done. Here, Ford is assigned a new car class so the car class i'm doing this with a mouse by the way this is oh, it's impressive look at that i don't want to use my pen there we go car uh, when you do this first line you'll say oh look this is a ford ford and then ford will then have the car will have inside it things like reg number reg num and it'll have a uh, make make and the ford inherits all these things so if you put ford full stop you have access to all of the attributes from the car class when did we do this we did this about two weeks before we finished for christmas or the last week last week for christmas yep all right so you get access to all the attributes and methods available to you okay Right, so then we move on to each part of this. So object-oriented has lots of different uh, main elements, let's call them. So encapsulation, so the things in red are the definitions. Encapsulation is the technical implementation that is hidden within the object. So encapsulation is the method of hiding of the implementation of a class and controlling access to its methods and attributes because we don't want everybody to access all the variables and all of the methods inside the class. Okay, so we, want to, we don't want to do that because people might tamper with things, access things that they shouldn't do, and they might mess things up. So here, up there in the top right hand corner, if you can make that out, certain things that in the car, if I had a car, for example, we would allow people to access like the fact that the computer can accelerate for us, it can change gear for us in an automatic car, and it can even brake for us if there's a safety element. Um, but we don't want them to change certain things, like in the fourth gear, the top speed is 65 miles an hour. We don't want anybody going over that, so we limit that, and then we don't let the computer access that anymore to change it, either by accident or on purpose. So we can prevent people from accessing things. And that's what encapsulation is all about. So what I said in class was... 
Think about a capsule, like a paracetamol, for example. Uh, in a capsule, those sort of, I don't know, called different color white and blue capsules. Um, inside, you've got the drug of the paracetamol. Okay, that is hidden with inside it. You eat the capsule, it melts away, and you've got the paracetamol. That's how I think of it. Capsule. That's how I remember encapsulation. Inheritance is very similar to the real world. Uh, lots of students easily access this in exams, no problem, because the idea that something is being passed down is is normal to us in our human life. So it has the same principle. So you inherit things like the hair colour from your parents and your height, for example, and your eye colour and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there you go. We've got a car and we've got a van. And you'll notice that in here, these are these are all the same as those. So we're basically doubling up. And one of the major advantages of using object oriented programming is with the fact we can reuse things. We can reuse it. So here, instead of doing this and we're duplicating how much code we're writing, we'll basically have the super class. Okay? Sometimes called the base class, sometimes called the parent class. Okay? I've seen it called lots of different things. Uh, and here, all of these things now all go into here and all go into here. Yet yeah, they are independent. These two things are not related. So you get a copy down here, you get a copy down there. And that's inheritance. Now then, polymorphism just means many forms. That's all it is. So we've looked at things like in Visual Basic, if we see this piece of code here and we give A the value of 10 and the B the value of five, this would be 10 plus five. And if you asked to output it, it'd output 15, wouldn't it? Because the plus symbol would go, these are numbers. So we're gonna add them together. Whereas in Visual Basic, if I said A was the classic example of cat and B, was the classic example of dog, you would have a cat dog on your hands because this would then, it wouldn't add them because they're not numbers. It would concatenate them, so it would squish them together. Okay, so the behavior is changed based on what data has been provided and that is polymorphism. Yeah, everything up to Christmas, Victoria. The only thing I said wouldn't be on the exam was Bacchus no form because we didn't cover it on the exam. That's why if you look on the top, look on the topic list. This is on there. Okay. So how does the system know what you want to do? You can override the behaviors you want for the task you are doing. That's polymorphism. Now, Abstraction is something we use every day. We don't know the intricacies of using an app on our phone. We don't know how it was built. We don't know how it was made. We don't know what it has to store, what has to be called and created. We just use our phone every day and we take it for granted. But that is because it's designed and developed. All the hard work's done in the background and it's easy for you to use. And that's abstraction. So we don't need to know what's happening in the code on our apps on our phone. We don't care what's happening. As long as I press the button and it does something that I want it to do, it gets done. So for example, when I drive to college tomorrow morning, uh, I can drive my car. I don't know how it works under the bonnet. I just know that if I put the key in and I turn it, the ignition comes on and fires up, put the clutch in and I put it in the gear and I drive off. Okay, I, that's all I know. There's a lot more technical things going on underneath the bonnet, but it doesn't matter. It's been abstracted away from me. Okay. So I can drive a car, but I don't know how it works because it's been abstracted away from me. Okay. Back as no form is not going to be on the test. So let's go back. So we've covered those two now. So that's programming paradigms. That's what we've just covered. Okay. Um, I think Boolean and truth tables and or not snans, nors, etc. Fairly straightforward. Please make sure you cover uh, what well, uh, oh, the back end of that as well. So you've got masking, clearing, and encryption. 
that's quite important. What else have I got in here? What's your So, right. Okay, data structures. So data structures, we have first starting off with arrays, the simplest form of data structures. You see them in almost every single algorithm on an exam paper. Okay, if you can't work out how arrays work, you need to go back to the basics. They have three things, an identifier, it's the name of the array. They have an index starting at zero because they are zero based. And then you have the element itself and that's the thing at the position okay so an array is a collection of variables of the same data type grouped together under a single identifier and that's such students sometimes struggle to get their head around that because this an array is not the same as a list okay they work in very similar fashions but a list in a language like python has you can put multiple data types inside the list works very similar but one dimensional arrays arrays are one data type only okay and each variable in the array is called an element and is accessed using its position and its position is its index okay so two dimensional arrays is basically an array an array of an array so in theory you can have arrays with large numbers of dimensions but at a level you only need to go to three dimensions so if you look there, you've got names and you've got Sam, Lucy, James, Jack and Jane in one array. Then you've got Peter, Sarah, Adam, Kieran and Verity in a separate array. And then you've got Emily, Edward, Dominic, Justin and Jake inside a third one. Okay. Now because it's all inside one array, it's actually two dimensions. So don't get caught out by that. It looks like that. So normally we use two dimensional arrays to represent uh, like, a, like a table of rows and columns. Okay, so if you wanted to, for example, access Sarah, that would be at this position here, position one one. Okay, now, print names one two would print out the word edward okay print one two so here you've got columns and you've got rows sometimes catches people out that one all right so three-dimensional arrays they get a little bit more complicated okay but three-dimensional arrays is basically a group of a group it's an array within a group so a single row in each table can be represented by a one-dimensional array. So that's Sally and 7TU. So that's those two. Then the entire table can be represented by a two-dimensional array. What am I doing? There you go. And then, uh, actually I should have put that there, shouldn't I? Zero. And then what you do then is you group these two together. So you've got one here and one here. 0, 1, and 2. And that is the third dimension. So this is dimension number 1. The rows and columns is dimension number 2. And then the whole two of those together is dimension number 3. Very difficult to visualize. I always go back to this example because it helps me separate things nice and neatly. Okay, but You, you will not be expected to go any further than three dimensions in your A level. Now records, records are mainly used in files. Okay, so a record, uh, records make up files. So a record is a set of data items all related to a single entity um, and they are classed as a collection of related fields. So unlike an array, a record may contain data items of more than one data type. So there is a record, you have Field names like member ID, first name, surname, gender, date of birth, and you have an integer, string, string, character, date. They are different data types, all under one identifier. And the one identifier could be, I don't know, user, for example, user. And that would can that is your identifier for the whole thing. All right. If I wanted to access that, I would say user, full stop, member, 
ID equals 001. Okay, that's how I would access the field. So this is the field and this is the record. All right, I'll write that in. Record and this is the field. The full stop allows us to access that. Stacks. Who doesn't love a good stack, okay? Students answered these very well, actually, in the past assessments when I scanned through them all. Uh, stacks are a last in, first out, okay? Last in, first out, or LIFO, data structure. Okay, so adding to the stack is called pushing. Taking off the stack is called popping. You might know about peaking as well, but you don't need to know about that for the A-level. If you know, great, but not needed, really. Pushing and popping. Pushing stuff on, popping stuff off. Stacks are easily implemented using an array or a linked list to hold data and a variable to point to the top of the stack, okay? You need to be able to pseudocode how to push and how to pop, okay? I'll say that again. You need to be able to pseudocode how to push and how to pop. We give this question before. There's no reason why we couldn't give it again. So popping off the stack. So you need to know where the top of the stack is. You can get the value into a variable by saying my stack at the position of pointer top, because pointer top is three. My stack is the array. So that's saying the value now holds my stack pointer top. Pointer top is three, zero, one, two, three. It's looking at Sam. So now we go my stack at position three is given empty. So Sam gets removed. And then it says empty. There you go. Point to top equals point to top minus one. What? Point to top equals point to top minus one? That means this now is the top of the stack. It is, isn't it? Because that's the last thing with information in. The others are empty. Look, empty, empty, empty. So that is how you show a, a stack in an array. Then you return the value. You basically send sam back because sam was stored inside value on this line here okay pushing to push the font of the stack you need the data to be pushed and the position to be pushed to all right so point to top so if i was pushing something on here point to top now is two so it's going to say two plus one is three so this is now the top of the stack my stack at the position of point to top so my stack at the position of three is given the data. Let's put John in there. Okay, so that gets crossed out. John goes in there at position three. Print my stack, so show it. Um, you can pop stuff, you can push stuff. This, where, 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 where? That should be separate. So that stuff down there isn't related to the push. Okay, you need to be able to pseudocode the push and the pop. Okay, I think I've made that fairly clear that you, that's what you need to do for your exams. I do like asking that question. Cues, first in, first out. If you're the first person in, you're the first person out. So this fun looking guy was the, was the first person to stand in the queue. So he's gonna be the first person to be served. Nice and simple. That person over there, don't matter. He's getting he's getting served last. Tough mate. So you can do the same thing. You can program a push and a pop for a queue as well. Sometimes it's called NQ, which is push on, uh, and DQ, which is pop, basically. All right. So pointer front is zero. So that's this one. It's the front of the queue. Value equals my queue point to front so sam is going to go inside here then it says my queue point to front equals empty so you get rid of that it says empty and then you say point to front equals point to front minus one well that seems to me like a bit of a problem because zero minus one is minus one not very good so you wouldn't do that normally. You would normally increment that. So for pushing, similar to what we saw before, data pointer back. 
okay? Add a new piece of data to the end of the queue. So the end of the queue is technically here, all right? Down there. So pointer back would be zero, one, two, three, four. So that would be four. Data would be John. And we'd go my queue equals pointer back equals data. So pointer back is four, data is John. So it's saying, get rid of that, put John in there. And then pointer back equals pointer back plus one because now the back of the queue is this one. Print my queue, pop. So again, that, uh, that bit there is not related to the push and pop method. Okay, so you need to be able to do that pseudocode as well for a queue. Once you get the head around the pointers, you should be absolutely fine. If you need to, draw it out. Draw it out. Trees. So binary tree structures are composed of nodes, sometimes called leaves, and links between them, sometimes called branches. Each node has up to two others coming off it. I have made a video about this. Now, please, people that are listening, in the chat, you just put for me, are you happy with traversals? Otherwise, I'm prepared to go through a traversal if I need to. Traversals. So that's pre, post, in order. Are you happy with traversals? Just a yes or no will do. Right, so each node has up to two others coming off it. This is a balanced tree because look at everything. If I slice it in half, whoa, it's balanced. Everything's perfect on either side. Okay. So binary trees are used to implement another data structure called a binary search tree. We use the word binary tree and binary search tree um, interchangeably. Okay. So they're identical, but the data on the left of the branch must be less than the data in the node. So normally when you build it, remember, you might have seen questions where it says, oh, you need to put in here, um, this is John at the top, you need to put in um, Alan, so add Alan to the tree. When it's a binary search tree, you look at this and go, if the first letter is less than uh, John, then it goes left. Well, A is, so it goes left, example, right? So that's what happens with binary search trees. And you're probably comfortable with these types of questions because I've seen um, the other teacher, Matt, Alex, and Phil go through a lot of these questions, okay? So you should be used to them kind of rules. The question will always give you um, the rules anyway, all right? So it'll always say less than goes on the left-hand side, greater than or equal to goes on the right-hand side, okay? It'll specify that for you. Now, you need to be prepared to do traversals, okay? So people, I mean, the people that have commented down there have said, yeah, they're okay. But there are three types of tra traversals, a post-order, an in-order, and a pre-order traversal. Just remember this and you'll be fine. Post-order is when the node is last. In-order is when the node is in the middle. Pre-order is when the node is at the start. So you've got left, right, node, left, node, right, and node, left, right, okay? So what, when you traverse this, the node, so the, the root node, that Sam would be last pre-order, sorry, in order, node, so Sam would be in the, exactly the middle, and then pre-order, Sam would be first, okay? Sam would be at the start. If you struggle with traversals, please go to my videos and have a go, okay? And then test yourself. There's loads of traversal questions on the internet. Do go and have a look. If you get stuck between now and Wednesday, Feel free to email me or I'll jump on a Google Meet or whatever and we can do some traversals. Linked lists. Underrated, to be honest, but they're probably the most common type of dynamic data structure. Dynamic means that it can expand and contract. Okay, It can change size quite easily. Once you declare an array, you don't normally change the size of the array. It's set all the time. So unlike arrays, they can grow to whatever size required, okay? The size isn't declared at the beginning, and I always think about a train, okay? A typical choo-choo train has lots of carriages, an engine at the front, for example, and the carriages can be taken off, added on. We can swap them if we need to. So linked lists are made up of nodes, and each node links to the next node in the list. So they're used to implement almost every other data, data structure that you know or you've learned about. So... If you're asked about these in your exam, there are two things that a linked list consists of. And the first one is the data itself. And the second one is the pointer. So here, 
you've got Sam is the data and the pointer is pointing to Peter. If you don't draw this or you don't explain this, you are going to lose marks. So be very, very careful. Two things, data and the pointer. Okay, next thing, or one of the last ones we're gonna look at is a hash table. Okay, it has two components. One, the actual table itself, uh, hello, the table. And then finally, the mapping function or the hash function or the hash algorithm it's called sometimes. Now the point of this is you take data, all right? So if I take data in like, uh, let's go Jonathan, okay? Let's take my name, my name, there you go. It's my full name. Uh, the hashing algorithm, if I said the hashing algorithm was, uh, let's just give us the length. Uh, and then multiply that by six, for example. Okay, so that's my hashing algorithm. Not great, probably the worst one in the world. Let's go, uh, Jonathan is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So I've got eight, so the length of Jonathan is gonna be eight, okay? And then what we do is we just times it by six, so eight times six is 48. That's 48. So that is gonna go into index position 48 which will be all the way down the list, all right? And that's where, that's location, so it's location 48. Now then, problems. If someone comes along with the same length name as me, and they do this, they're gonna get the same number, and there's gonna be a clash. That's a problem, okay? Now, you're gonna do more um, looking into this stuff, but basically, when you have a clash, you have a couple of different choices you can basically append it onto the end of the file and put what we call a flag to say, oh, there's something here, there's a clash, so I'm gonna stick it in the end of my file. If you stick it on the end of your file, then you have to linear search it. And you know how bad a linear search actually is, I'm sure. Okay, so there we go. These are the problems now. So collisions created by the hash hashing function can lead to more records being stored in a single block. Each block has a maximum record count. So, if I was to draw a file for you, is my file, this is a block. Let's call this block one, two, three, etc. Each block you split up into sections, sections, they're all equal. And as we fill up more of these blocks with data, the chance of a collision increases, doesn't it? because we're filling up more. Look at that. So, we can create an overflow at the end. Overflow. And we linear search this. Or, what we can do is we can create a new file. Here we go. And we can make new blocks, bigger blocks, with more options in them, or more sections in them. Look at that, Picasso. If anyone wants to buy this, uh, I've turned this into an NFT, by the way, and you can buy it from me. I, I only accept Bitcoin or Ethereum. Anyway, so there we go. I can put, I can basically spread it out more. This second one is the more time consuming option. The first one is normally what we do. Um, the better your hashing algorithm is, the, the, less, oh, the, the less collisions that we have. It's not for sale to you, you're banned. Overflow, progressive overflow. Um, so when we reach the end, the file, if the location is occupied, use the next available location. If the end of the list of the file is reached, we wrap around and start again. So if I go back to this, okay, what we do is progressive overflow says we're full, so we're gonna go back to the start and we're gonna keep looping round to see if we've got a spare space back in the position where we were. Uh, it's not massively efficient. Uh, or we can use flags. So we flag the original block, and we move the data to the overflow, and we linear search it. That's the default. That's what we normally do. Okay. Again, going back to binary trees now, pointers and arrays. So unlike stacks and queues, 
there's a range of different ways to traverse binary tree structures. So these are the in-order, post-order, and pre-order traversals. And you've seen, you've done this question already. I've definitely seen you've done this question with your other teacher, Phil, Alex, or Matt. But these are all in here anyway for you to have a go at if you need them, okay? Because I don't want to spend all, all night looking through these. Yeah, pointers, 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 link list pointers. Um, yeah. So there is the pseudocode for you as well, if you need some pseudocode for adding nodes to link lists. So people will have individual needs as to where they're at. But again, this is why Omer asked me at the start, he asked me about why am I doing this on Monday, on a bank holiday, instead of doing it on Tuesday. And I want to give you a little bit of time to sort of assess yourself and give you 24 hours to ask questions, basically. All right. So, what I normally see, students often confuse stacks and queues and they expect them to behave like an array, okay? And they can't behave like that. These are all independent data structures. Now, some data structures can have data structures inside them, like records. You can have, a, you can have a, an array of records. So each element of an array can have a record inside it. For queues and stacks, reading data is also deleting it, okay? So when you read it or you pop it, it actually deletes it, doesn't it? So remember that. Um, students often mix up tree traversal algorithms. So that's why I said remember your three types, your node left right, your left node right, and your left right node. They often get confused and mixed up. I always mark questions and you've done the wrong traversal method. Hash tables do not have indices and students need to be reminded of that fact, okay? So hash tables, they don't often contain numbers, okay? The data is what is needed to create the index position. Okay, you can use multiple appropriate data structures if you want to, if you're pseudocoding, use whatever data structure you want. Right. So we're going to bring through them. Do, 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 do. Logic operations. Big O. Right. Do people want to look at a, a big O question? It's one thing I've not covered. Big O was on there. Compression, algorithms. We can do a pseudocode question and we can do a big O question. We're getting towards the end of this stuff. Don't want to overdo it on the live stream. How long have we been going for now? One hour and 42? Okay. Let's look at a big old question. There we are. So hopefully you can see that. So in hash tables, we don't have um, numbers to specify the location. So what I mean by that is we take the data and the data tells us the position. So let's say a position was four. Okay, so I, I put data in the fourth position. We don't store position integer number four. We would basically say we store John at position four. So we then put John into the algorithm and it spits out the number and then we go to that number. So all we mean is we just don't store the index position or the indices, the actual number of the thing itself. I suppose what I'm trying to say is we use data to work out the number position rather than anything else. We don't store numbers. Now then, typical question. Um, I don't think we've seen this one before because I found this in the, the the newer ones, the 2021 versions. But basically, 
Have we seen this one before? No, I haven't seen this one before. Right. So remember, we've got met, we've got steps again, haven't we? Right. So big O notation. What is the purpose of big O notation? It is to tell us the efficiency, the spatial and the time complexity of an algorithm. Okay. How fast it's going to run, whether it's the memory space or the time space. As we add more data in, what the hell is the algorithm going to do, people? What's it going to do? Here, algorithm. So we've got a search algorithm. Great. Thanks for telling me that. Much appreciated. Declare, search key, I, J, N, found, my array, N, N, right? Oh, that, that is a two-dimensional array. Well, it said that. It said that it was a two-dimensional array already. Okay. So, do you remember the steps? Probably not. So step one, what we're going to do is we're going to look at four, these four loops. How many four loops have we got? We've got one here for the I loop and one here for the J loop. Okay, so we've got two loops. That's important. Are they nested? Well, yes. So I know because it's nested, this is gonna run for N number of times. This is gonna run for N number of times. It's actually gonna be order of N squared. That is my, that is my end goal. If you just put order of n squared, you're going to get the mark. One mark for just writing that. Now, how does John, how does John know that this is n? And how does he know that this is n as well? Okay, so n by n is n squared. I told you originally that this business with this minus one, the exam board, get themselves, get themselves all messed up. So in the mark scheme, it would accept this runs n minus one times and this runs n minus one times and then you multiply them together. I will make it very simple for you. Just get rid of them. Constants do not matter. Okay. I've just been told there might be a bit of a buffering issue. It should sort itself out in a second. So, uh, right, so we've got an I loop. I loops N times. And what does the J do? J loops N squared times because it's N inside N. Now, what we need to do here is we need to look, we need to look specifically at what the question's saying. Evaluate the efficiency of the searcher algorithm and using big annotation, determine the growth rate for time performance. So what operations have we got going on? When I say operations, I'm talking about anything that will slow our algorithm down. So inside the I loop, what operations have I got inside there? Operations, let me just put this here. Operations. We have pluses and minuses and multiplications and uh, swaps and pff, divisions and mods and greater than, less than, blah, all sorts of stuff, all kinds of stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look and go inside the I loop, you've got one here, which is I equals I plus one, because that's what that means. So I've got one operation in there and the J loop, I have if my array ij is equal to the search key, okay? Now this, this is not memory. It's not being assigned, it's being compared. So that's gonna be one operation. 
output, it's nothing to do with me, found equals true, that's an assignment, so that's memory. So I think that is it. I'm just looking any more. Is there any more? Any more? Any more? Any more? Okay. Okay. Now then, this is interesting because we've probably never seen this before. Uh, J loops in N is so it's one operation. One operation in there. Now, that's great. They're all inside. So what are we going to do now? Look outside of this, input the search key, found equals false. Outside here, in this statement here, we've got if found is not equal to true. That in itself is an operation, but it's not inside a loop. So it has no N. It just has an operation. So that just sits on its own. It's like, well, there's one there. One. So if you add all these together, oh, good spot. Yes, good spot. Thank you, George. Didn't even know you were here. That's good. J equals J plus one. I forgot my next J there. So that's two operations inside there. So what you'd get there is you'd get uh, one N plus 2n squared plus 1. And obviously 1n is just going to be n plus 2n squared plus 1. Then what we do is we drop the constants. So we get n plus n squared. So the constant gets dropped there. Constant gets dropped there, which is just going to be order of n squared. Okay, so steps for your big O notation, people. Firstly, identify the loops. Then, identify the number of operations inside those loops. And here, for the first time, we've seen operations outside of the loops. They are just going to be constants. So you just write the constant outside the loop like we did here. They're going to be forgotten about anyway. So as we basically go through the process of dropping the constants, which one is more dominant when we scale up? So as n increases, what's going to happen in the dominance between those two? n squared is going to grow faster. Therefore, it's more dominant. And that, that means this algorithm is n squared. Why is it 2n squared? Because there was two operations inside the J loop. The one here with the equal symbol and the one here that you mentioned at the end of J. All right. Now then, determine the growth rate for memory space used during a single run of the algorithm. Okay, memory space used. Now in the questions we looked at, the, the answer to these questions is normally in the description of what we're looking for. Now, look at what it says. It says the algorithm searches for data item, a data item in an unsorted two dimensional square array. Okay, which is this. So we've got my array. Okay, so my array. I'll just, I'll visualize it for you, my array, and it has rows, columns, whatever, who knows how long it is, it goes to N, it goes to N. Now, be careful, because a lot of students would go, well, it's a two-dimensional array, you've got N by N, so it's N squared, okay? It is not. You have one unsorted two-dimensional square array. If you look, my array is the only storage you've got. It's the only data structure that we're using to store. So you've got one two-dimensional array. 
So it's going to be 1n. So again, it seems like all these questions are always order of n, or you could have order of 1, because it's, it's, it's constant, isn't it? It's always going to be the same. You start the search algorithm with n number of two-dimensional items. You can't subtract them. You can't delete them. You can't scale your, your array down. You can't expand it. The size will always be the size from when you start to when you finish. You can look at them. You can search through them. But the memory space is always going to be the same. If I start this algorithm with 10 elements in my two-dimensional array, you are going to end with 10 elements in your two-dimensional array. Therefore, it's always going to be constant. That's why you can have order of one. And that's sometimes, students sometimes struggle to understand that. Okay, so the, the total storage requirements is going to be one array for this search algorithm. It doesn't search two or three or five arrays. It's just one. It searches one uh, array. I forgot what I was going to say then. Now then, I need to clear some lists away. Lost my brushes. Get rid of that. Last question. How many marks? Four marks. Four marks. Last question. Uh, that one. Okay. Let's make it a little bit bigger. So identify the time complexity and draw a graph of the algorithm above to illustrate the order of time performance. Graph paper is not required. Well, wait a minute. What? Time performance? Of the above algorithm well we've just worked out that it's order of n squared order of n squared so if i was to draw this identify the time complexity and draw the graph okay hmm, interesting so firstly if you've got a correct if you put down well the order of complexity is order of n squared believe it or not this seems ridiculous. You get a mark. You get a mark for doing to saying it again. So it, it pays off to get the question right in the first place. Okay. Then your second mark comes from the graph. Apologies for this graph, by the way. Um, I need to turn my pad to the side. Remember what you're going to get marks for here. Oh, I can't. I can't draw on the side. My, my graphics tablet's not letting me do it. I'm side drawing. Time to time to complete. And down here, you'd have size of data or something like that. I told you all, I told every single person in my class, classes, that if you label, you get one mark. Label, you get one mark. In the mark scheme, it'll say the time axis label correctly, you get a mark for it. If you label the, um, the size axis correctly, you get one mark for it in this question. This is a four mark question for literally working out, well, what is order of n squared? It's it comes under it's polynomial time. So if you can remember what your graphs look like for polynomial, um, it's relatively okay initially. So as the size of the data increases, the time to complete is fairly low. But then it starts to grow pretty quick. That would probably, that's kind, yeah, I think that's okay. That would probably get marks still. All right, polynomial time. So as you add, as the size of data increases, the time to complete grows very quickly. So they're not very efficient algorithms. And think about it. If this was a linear search, which it could well be, 
if it's got fairly small numbers in your linear search, time to complete is not that bad. It's the best case scenario, that, of a linear search. But as you have a billion items in a linear search, it's going to take forever, isn't it? So there we are. Big old notation. Are there the kind of questions that you're going to come up against? And I think what we are now, two hours. All right. Um, what have we got left on that list? I might, I might say this is getting towards the end. Let's do an algorithm question then. Cover pseudocode. We've covered lots of bases then. All right. Typical pseudocode question. Very AS like this. Now then. There's a scenario. With pseudocode questions, you're going to get a scenario. The scenario is going to give you logic. You're going to have to decompose the problem and then write it. All right? So, uh, ice zone. There's something called ice zone. It has to maintain strict temperature controls over the skating surface. So, it's an ice rink of some kind using a recognized convention. Um, finals, I think, highly likely. And by finals, I think you mean final exams. I think it's going to be likely. So using a recognized convention, design an algorithm to help ice zone control temperature of the ice. The algorithm should repeatedly, so when it says repeatedly, I hope you're thinking the same thing as me. Uh, repeatedly. I'm thinking a loop. Allow the user to input the temperature in degrees Celsius. Okay to the nearest 0.1 degree. The algorithm should continuously loop, oh, I'll give it you there, until a rogue value. Ooh. Rogue values um, are basically terminating values. So if, if we hit 100, then we stop looping. Okay, that's our loop condition. Uh, the algorithm should compare the value entered to the following set values and output the correct message. So here, is your logic. A positive number above minus 2.1 should provide the message temperature too high. Between 2.1 and 4 should provide the message suitable for general skating. Four, minus 4.1 to 5.5 should provide the message suitable for competition ice skating. 5.6 to 9 suitable for ice hockey and below 9 should provide the message fault detected. Your algorithm should be written using self-documenting identifiers. Now, because it said recognize convention, you could you could go with a flowchart if you wanted to. Now, that's because this is probably more likely um, an AS question. But for you, um, it would probably it would probably specify pseudocode directly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put up here. I'm going to start my code up here because I'm probably going to go all the way down, I think. So the first thing, let's get, let's keep it simple. Let's get the current temperature, right? So get someone to enter the current temperature. So what I'll do is I'll say uh, current temp, let's call it current temp. That's a self-documenting identifier. Current temp is real okay why is it real because it's a decimal point value isn't it yeah uh, 0 0.1 degrees decimal point value and what i'll do is i'll say i'm going to set that set the current temp to equal 100 now why am i doing that because I want them to set it to something other than that um, because if it's 100, it's going to break out my loop. So what I might do is I might save a bit of space in case I need anything else. But let's do 
let's do what kind of loop should we have uh, post condition loop maybe I'll do a do like here and then I don't know where this is going to go I might have to move this in a bit but let's give myself a lot of space and I'll put down here while I'll do a do while loop because it's based on a condition so do while and I'll put in brackets my condition so my condition is this rogue value business and I'll say do while current temp do less than of 100 uh, so if I want loop until the rogue value of 100 is entered do while well, less than so I'll continue to loop while the current temp is less than 100 that's going to be the plan okay then what I'll do is inside that I'm going to get the person to import the current temp so we use import in pseudocode we don't need to use anything like input box because we're not writing in Visual Basic. And then what we'll do is we'll say, if the current temp is equal to 100, then what we're gonna do? Uh, so because it's a post condition loop, I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna have to do a condition, I think. I'm gonna have to say, if the current temp I'll just put some text in here. Do nothing. Okay. Now remember what I said before, if you missed this in the earlier part, because this is a post condition loop, it means it will run the code once first. And if somebody, if, the, if this is currently a hundred, okay. Um, I'll put greater than or equal to a hundred. So if somebody puts in something that's greater than or equal to a hundred, then it'll do nothing and then it'll get down to the while loop and then it'll stop the program, okay? Because it'll fail the condition. So I'm gonna do nothing in that part there, which might seem a bit strange, but it's because I've written it how I have. Now I'll go to, and uh, I'll do the if and I'll say else here. So else, we're gonna do some other if statements. So I'm gonna do an if inside here and I'm gonna do my conditions. So if the current temperature The current temp is greater than minus 2.1 because that's the first one here. Okay? If it's greater than 0 0.1, then the temperature is too high. So I'll do if, then. And what you do is you, in pseudocode, you don't put, please don't put message boxes. Output, temperature too high. Now, once you've got yourself going like this, you would then say, you could do an else if. Now, I'm clearly gonna run out of space. So I'd say, uh, I just wanna show you this next one because the rest will be self-explanatory once, uh, once I've done this one. So else if, current temp, is less than or equal to 2.1, it's minus 2.1. So I'm now currently doing this condition. It says minus 2.1 to 4.0. Now you've got to be in between that range. So you've got to do an and condition because both has to be true. And current temp, so you have to say current temp again. I see students always leaving this out like this. You've got to specify again, current temp, is greater than or equal, yeah, it's equal to, I think, minus 4.0. When you write then, going off the screen, oh. Then we're gonna output suitable, what is it, suitable for general skating. 
suitable for general skating. Okay, done that. Now, what you would do then is you would go along and you go down the list and say, right, we'll do 4.1 and 5.5, 5.6 and 9, and then 9 or above, okay? Once you've done that, you would just end the ifs at the bottom. And I can't see anything else. It's fairly straightforward, this one, isn't it? So what things are being assessed, okay? If you look at the pseudocode, all I would do is I'd include the rest of the statements in the in the if statements. But what I want to do is just show you what the examiner will be looking for. So in this algorithm, they're going to be looking for, can you input things? Okay, can you use the word input to take things from the user? Can you loop? And in this one, it had a terminating condition. So what loops do you have? If you want to loop a specific number of times, you're going to use a for loop for i equals 1 to whatever. Okay. If you want to use um, a loop like a do while, you can say do while and have your condition to start off with. Or you can have a do and then your while condition after. You can have a repeat until and your condition in there. Okay, feel free to use whatever loop, but they're trying to assess you on which iteration you would use. Okay, then what they're also going to do is they're going to get you to work out whether you can do selection. And you know what selection is? If statements. And remember, you might have nested if statements. Nested is an if inside an if, for example. That's nested selection or you can have nested iteration, which is a loop inside a loop. So look out for that as well. Normally what they assess is they assess uh, means or averages, modes, uh, most frequent, medians, Okay, so they'll get you to do basic mathematics stuff going on there. Um, they might ask you to use uh, mods, modular, modular division. Um, what else have I seen in algorithms? Always outputs, okay? Output with suitable message, okay? Suitable message means you need to, you can't just output mean variable. You have to output your mean is and then comma mean output it with something else. All right, they always look to assess the same things over and over again. Inputs, looping, selection, calculations, and mathematics in there. Can you do? Can you do that and, and produce the algorithm? Can you understand the problem that's being asked of you and output it? That's what they're asking. There's no easy way to go about algorithms apart from practicing them over and over again. Okay, now uh, we're coming up to two hours and 13 minutes. I'm here for people to ask questions uh, now. So I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to see if people have any questions before I call it a day. Remember, I'll still be accessible um, tomorrow. So I go back to college tomorrow uh, while you're on study leave. And you can also ask me on the morning because your remember your exam is not till quarter past two. But please do check your room on Cedar. Does anybody have any more questions?
Okay, if there's nothing else, all I can say is thank you very much for attending. Hopefully you found something in there useful. Um, I will timestamp this and I'll send the video out so people can quickly reference things. Um, I wish you the best of luck in your mocks. You really need to make them count because who knows what's going on with this world at the moment. And like I said, if you need me, you know where I am, you know what my email is, feel free to get in touch, okay? Stay safe and I'll see you on Wednesday. Please do not be late and bring all the required equipment of you, okay? Have a safe night. I'll see you later.